Great face. Well, good morning, HBF. It's good to see you. I hope that uh, you enjoy the day. Um, my name's Jim, and uh, I don't see any, any visitors, any guests today. Oh, we do have a guest. Where's the guys with the bags? Mark Newland, would you grab her a bag back there with the Tootsie Rolls? And it's got a Bible in it, got some information about the church. That's good, uh, Jody. You, you pointed her out. I appreciate her. So we're glad to have you here. We hope that you enjoy the service today. Anybody out there on the internet that's watching us, if you want to contact us, it's contact hbfcast.org. And, or you can call us on the phone, 816-380-3033. I'm sorry. So uh, with that, let's, James, let's have some fun. With, praise God. All right. Thank you. 303. They'll get you a loan, but they can't get you saved. No, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> Neither can we. That's all Jesus. Um, if you guys want to stand up with us uh, at home, you can stand up, stomp the floors, rake, wake your neighbors up. Uh, if your kids are still in their bathroom, make them dance around. Um, but uh, we're going to sing, Oh, Come to the Altar, and uh, we'll kick this one off. So let's do this, Samuel. Robert? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. What a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Sing that one again. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. 
bow down before him. And bow, bow down, down before, before him. For he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar. Oh, come, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross. Ready? Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Jesus is calling. Thank you. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Lord. You know, Brian was just talking about in his message, you know, uh, hearken unto the words of a man of God. Because you know what? In there is safety and truth and uh you know, like he says, God's word does not come back void. It goes out and it accomplishes its purpose so that when when a man of God says, this is, this is what God's laid on my heart, maybe your ears should perk up a little bit and see what it is that he was saying because uh, it might have relevance in your life or for, for people that you know that you can relate to. And, and uh, you know, so, oh, praise the only one. Christ is the only one that's worthy of praise. You know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, that, that triune God and one, they are the only ones that truly deserve praise. And everything else is just, is just uh, what is it, uh, tinkling cymbals and a creaking gate, like Paul would say, I think. Or maybe not Paul. Forgive me, whoever wrote Romans. I'm just drawing a blank right now. Uh, but, you know, I don't want to be that squeaky gate and I don't want to be that rattling symbol I want to I want to be a, a, an instrument of praise and worship I think everybody here who wants to sing and praise the Lord wants that same thing so oh praise the only one let's sing this one There is no greater truth than this There is no stronger love we know God himself comes down to live And makes us in his heart is thrown There is no deeper peace than this No other kindness can compare He clothes us in His righteousness Forever free, forever is Oh, shines brighter than ten thousand suns death and hell call him victorious praise him oh praise the one true king lifting light crown we lay down at his feet praise him 
praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. There is no, there is no sweeter joy than this. There is no stronger hope we hold. We are His forevermore. Safe, secure by Christ alone. Oh, praise the only one. Oh, praise the only one who shines brighter than ten thousand suns. Death and hell call him victorious. Praise him. Oh, praise the one true king lifted loud till earth and heaven ring every crown we lay down at his feet praise him there is no sound that's like the song that rises up from grateful saints We once were lost but now we're found One with him we bear his name Sing that line again One with him we bear his name Who pray shines brighter than ten thousand suns death and hell call him victorious praise him who praise the one true king lifted light Till earth and heaven ring Every crown We lay down at his feet Praise him Oh, praise the only one Oh, praise the only one Who shines bright Ten thousand sons of death and hell call him victorious. Praise him. Who oh, praise the one true king lifted loud till earth and heaven. Every crown we lay down at his feet, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you so much. We, uh, we're so grateful, you know, for the fact that uh, even though we're dirty, rotten, filthy scoundrels, a lot of us are, um, we just, we humble ourselves to you, Lord. I know there's a lot more work to be done, a lot more people to be saved, but perhaps today, Lord, if today be the day, each one of us are pitching our tent closer to the end of the beginning every day, Lord, and let us make... Uh, count our, our days, uh, for they are numbered, Lord, just, uh, just as your word says. Let us just be profitable to you, profitable to the mission, profitable to 
um, the word of God, Lord. Come and join us. Anoint the uh, ears and the hearts to hear the message that's about to be preached, Lord. Uh, those that are at home, those that are in-house, Lord. Uh, I just look forward to the day coming soon that we can all get together. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Lord, I, uh, I ask you to just please come and be with us. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this morning at HBF. If you're joining us live this morning, we're glad that you were uh, dropping in with us. And if you're an HBF uh, member or one of our church family or friends, we're glad that you've been with us throughout this COVID crisis. And thank, thank you for all those that are in the house today. So praise the Lord for that. Yeah. Every week we grow incrementally. Yeah. Awesome. It's so, it's incredible. So, uh, hey, it's Memorial Weekend, and I am glad that uh, we are able to come together today and uh, we're discovering our DNA in the book of Acts. And uh, man, I tell you, when we come to a day like today, and we, it's Memorial Weekend, so a lot of people are at the lake today doing a lot of different things, and uh, we're here remembering. Because tomorrow, that's when our nation sets aside time uh, to commemorate the sacrifice of those faithful men and women who gave the ultimate sacrifice in defense for the, of the United States of America from the Revolutionary War to today. All Americans have a, you know, a debt of gratitude to those that sacrificed <clears throat> to you know, give us the liberty. And we think of all those who died. Uh, you know, I, I think particularly about, um, you know, um, Joe, Joe Sparks, you know, who invaded Okinawa uh, with General MacArthur and all the people he knew personally that sacrificed their life. You know, Memorial Day would have meant a great deal to men like that. Uh, my grandfather was also in the Second World War and, and uh, in active combat. Um, you think about those kinds of sacrifices, um, it's, it's, in, it's, it's hard to even fathom. And Loyal George, who was also a member of our church, he was in Pearl Harbor. And, uh, of course, we know that Pearl Harbor, many people died. He was fortunate to escape uh, that um, bombardment. And so these are real people that, that were members of our church, but now we remember them because they've gone on to glory. And so it's those things that we think about. And we think about that sacrifice. And we also think about the faithful saints that, uh, you know, have really over the last several centuries been counted as, as sheep to the slaughter, as the Bible says and uh, Hebrews 11:38 says that the world is not worthy of these nameless men and women and sometimes children over the last couple thousand years that have sacrificed their lives to worship, uh, oftentimes unnoted in history. But God knows every one of those names, and I know he remembers each one of them, and we'll get to meet all of them. Uh, of course, just even recently, this week, saints have gone home to be with the Lord, and Ravi Zachari Zacharias passed away, and then Pastor Carl Silva, a dear friend of HBF's, in uh, Mumbai, India, uh, passed away and was promoted to glory even this week. So when you think about Memorial Weekend, you think about physical combat and soldiers who lost their life in combat, but we also think of spiritual uh, saints that uh, fought a good fight and ran their course. So it's good to remember. It's really good to remember those that have sacrificed to set us free. Uh, next week, we're going to remember... The one person, the main person who sacrificed to set us free, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, I've announced this several times. I'm going to announce it once again. So next Sunday morning at 1030, we're going to have one uh, church service here. And it will be about, I don't know. We'll see how full it will be. It looks like it will just about fill up the room uh, as with safe distancing. So I think it will be good. If, in fact, we have to overflow, we'll have overflow. So just one service, 10 30 uh, for uh, worshiping the Lord's Supper. Now, ABFs will still be functioning next week, so consult your ABF pastor for time uh, for your service. Most are meeting in the evening still. So, uh, And if they aren't, they will let you know, and uh, I think Passpoint has another time that they meet as well. So continue to, to monitor that, and uh, we'll be together for that. Then the week after that, we'll be together for uh, Church in the Park on the 7th of June, so everyone will gather that day will be one service at Church in the Park. It'll be a great time at 10 o'clock in the morning. We do that every year. And then, on Lord willing, on the 14th of June, we'll come back together <clears throat> in our normal schedule. And uh, you will be hearing more about that soon because we got to keep planning for that. But there's no greater memorial, of course, than the Lord's Supper. So if you're not able to physically be here, I know many are watching online, uh, we want to get the elements to you. We have prepared prepackaged elements and... Uh, I know some of the deacons are already uh, en route to some of your homes uh, with elements. Uh, the church will be open this week. You can come by if you're able. If you're not able, please let us know and, and or we'll be contacting you uh, to see if we can drop some by. And so next Sunday, you'll be able to worship with us and take the Lord's Supper. And we'll all be doing it simultaneously at the same time. 
All right, so last week we spoke about how Paul set sail on his journey to Rome. And uh, <clears throat> we've been talking about this, uh, this in this sermon series that we're in. It's really, um, it's really the uh, Finishing Strong sermon series. I'm gonna, I tried to finish strong and get through everything this morning in this chapter. We're not going to quite do it, but I am going to get through quite a bit. And so uh, we're going to be talking this morning about how Paul, <clears throat> he, um, he never uh, was able to return to his homeland, was he? He had to sail away from Jerusalem. He won't return again till the second coming of Christ. And uh, he, he was preparing to go home to heaven, but he still had to stop in Rome. So he knew where he was going and he knew how, that he, God would get him there because God had already promised that. And last week we saw that that journey uh, wasn't over just because he knew how things were going to end and where he was going. There were still storms uh, and difficult seas in which he would have to pass. And we started looking at that in Acts chapter 27. And if you don't have a Bible, you can grab one from the seat rack in front of you or the seat under you, or if you have a guest bag, there should be one in there. We're going to be on page 1,497, 1,497 in that Bible, 1,497, and um, that's the book of Acts, chapter 27, 1497. So uh, you'd be turning to there, and we'll be reading that text in just a moment. And as you're turning there, I just want to speak to you a little bit about the Midwest weather, because if you live here, we we all uh, understand that... uh, we have unique weather here, and the saying goes around here that if you don't like the weather, just wait a few minutes, right? And then it'll change. And so um, this time of year, we especially understand that a nice sunny day can turn into a devastating storm just like that. And there are a few of us who live in the Midwest <clears throat> who've even experienced the, the terror of a tornado, right? Or that eerie calm right before a major storm. You know, it's just all of a sudden the birds kind of stop chirping and everything stops and it's calm. And then, of course, boom, it hits you, you know. And, uh, and then here comes the storm. In fact, this time of year, we understand that storms are to be expected. We kind of expect storms, don't we? we? We are used to that. And uh, just a few weeks ago, many in our church family lost property and power due to the spring storm that just flew through the southern part of Cass County. And, and uh, people's barns were you know, destroyed and, and uh, people lost property and there was damage. And uh, I had a relative, my, my cousin's husband's aunt passed away in Butler, uh, just a freak. Uh, that storm, a, a freak accident, a, a limb falls from a, a tree, goes through the roof, and and uh, and then she passed away. So it was a terrible tragedy, because storms are kind of like that. They're just they're just they can just come up on you, unexpected, and and crazy things happen. And and so in the middle of a storm, especially around here, y'all know what we do. We take shelter, right? Nobody wants to be out in a storm. Um, I remember when I was a kid, we'd be going to the lake, and there's no uh, no worse feeling than having a tornado warning. And be pulling an RV down some country road somewhere in Missouri, <clears throat> and there is nowhere to go, you know. And the hail starts hitting your windshield, and you're like, "Are we next?" You know, it isn't like the movies. You know, it, it makes you a little bit. They may, used to make me nervous because you just never know when those storms are going to come upon you. And I tell you what, here in the Midwest, when a storm like that comes, we want to seek shelter. And you know where we go? We go into the foundation of our house. We, if you have a basement, you get there, especially during a tornado. Because you want to be in the foundation. And, of course, that's a type of Christ, right? We want to, when the storms of life come, you want to be founded in Christ. You want to get closer to Christ. You want to just, be, uh, just go back to that rock, right? And, and so you can imagine the safety that we can find in Christ. But can, imagine, can you imagine being on a, a ship in the ocean? There is no foundation. I mean, you, it's just you and that ship. In the middle of a storm, you know, out of control, And, you know, there are things that come in life, storms that come in life, and it feels as though everything is out of your control. And indeed, it very well may be. But we rest in the reality that nothing, nothing is outside of God's control. Nothing is. So if you have your Bibles, and you do, let's look at Acts chapter 27, and we're going to look at verse 10. Acts 27 and verse 10. I'm going to read the rest of this chapter. We're going to actually start in verse 9. Uh, when Paul is, is speaking, and we, we already had a look at this last week, so I'm going to overlap it from last week. Uh, we, we pick it up in verse 9 of Acts 27. Paul, speaking now to Julius, he says, Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the, the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished him. Now the fast he's speaking of is the, the Feast of Atonement, and the fast he knew that it was getting to be um, September, October. This is no time to sail in the ocean. Uh, everyone knew that, including Paul. So it's time to park the boat. We've already covered that last week. And so the fast has passed, and he's like, let me give you some advice. Now, when much time 
or verse 10, and, and, uh, and said unto them, Sirs, Paul speaking, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master of the, <clears throat> and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter, in the more part, uh, in, in the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenix and there to winter, which is in haven of Crete and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. And some of you pronounce that Euroclidon. I think it's actually Euroclidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands strake sail, and so were driven. And being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day lightened the ship. And the third day was cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whose I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit, we must uh, be cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven upon, or up and down, I'm sorry, in Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to the same country. I'm sorry, to some country. And sounded and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, they cannot be saved. So what they were doing is feigning that they were going to go out and check these anchors or set some anchors and buoys where the anchors were. But Paul knew they're just trying to escape, right? They see land, they're in the boats, they're just going to keep on going until they hit shore. Paul said in verse 31, you know, except these abide in the ship, they cannot be saved. So then it says in verse 32, the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is, this is for your health. For there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks uh, to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat, and they were all in the ship, two hundred, three score, and sixteen souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lighted the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. They lightened the ship, I'm sorry, and, and cast out the wheat into the sea. Verse 39, and when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up anchors and committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made, uh, uh, made toward shore and falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and, for, and the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim out and escape. 
But the centurion, willing uh, to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on board, some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Heavenly Father, as we sit before your, your word and we take in this story, Lord, what a great narrative. Really, the several chapters up to this point are, and, and this chapter in particular is Luke joins the journey and gives us these detailed, uh, uh, detailed nuances to every aspect of what was going on. I pray, God, that you would open up our eyes that we would see this morning, that this would not just be a story upon ears that are uncircumcised, Lord, upon hearts that are hard, Lord. I pray, God, that our, our ears would be open, our hearts would be awake to, to what the Word of God has to say this morning. I thank you and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, we're going to see how, how God provides hope in the midst of the storm. And you'll notice that God saved 276 souls by using his servant, Paul. And today, God wants to use you <clears throat> to be hope in the midst of a storm. I hope you are that or you have hope if you are in the midst of a storm. We had a lot of people in the first service respond to the word of God today. And I pray that God would work in our hearts this morning as if, if you find yourself in a storm, God has a purpose for it. And even if you're not in a storm today, remember, it's like Missouri in this life, and you never know when the weather's going to change. And before you know it, you may be taking your final voyage to heaven, and you may have a few more storms to face. We really don't know, but we know this. This is the fourth time that the Apostle Paul has been shipwrecked. So he knows a little bit about surviving storms, because God sees us through every trial. I was mentioning earlier this year that it occurred to me that every decade I have, I have these certain blessings and certain challenges and certain things that happen. It's like a pattern, and I didn't really realize that until I was reflecting at the first of this year how that, is, how that works. You know, it just seems like every decade something is incredibly good and incredibly difficult, and, and God is, is always growing and challenging us. Paul is going through his, at, least, at least his fourth major storm and shipwreck. I mean, I mean, man, this guy's seen some things in his life. And yet, Paul becomes, well, what we should all be, the hope in the midst of a storm. He's the one with the words of life. He's the one that says, hey, guys, this, uh, thus saith the Lord God. This is what God has. So if we're going to be, in, be hope in the storms of life, there are three things that we need to glean this morning from this passage. And by God's grace, I'll get them all, at least most of it in. Number one, um, we got to warn people. That's the bottom line. We got to warn people. Uh, and we also got to wait. Just because you warn people doesn't mean they're ready. Sometimes you got to wait. And the third thing is we got to win. Warn, wait, and win. And we'll look, we're going to break this down here as we go through it. And we'll get, uh, we'll get as I said in the last service, 2.9 or 2.9 points done this morning. We aren't going to quite finish it up, but we'll, we're going to almost get there. So the first thing I want you to see this morning is that we got to warn those in peril. It's pretty obvious that's what Paul's doing, right? You know, Paul's a prisoner. He didn't have to warn anybody. He could just cross his arms and say, huh, like Jonah, let them perish, you know? These chumps, a bunch of Romans. No, he doesn't have that attitude at all. He warns respectfully. In Acts 27.10, he says, sirs. Right, twice he says, sirs. Even when he's rebuking him later, he says, sirs. I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only to the lading, which is the loading, and the ship itself, but also our lives. I mean, guys, uh, this is risky business. I think our lives are in peril here, and the ship is in peril, and what's on the ship is in peril. So your money, but also your lives, right? You're, you know, there's a lot at stake. Now, Paul is respectful of Julius, uh, the centurion, the master of the ship and the owner. They all have a lot to lose. There's not one of those men on that ship, uh, especially the owner and, the, and the, uh, the ship master, nor Julius, that don't have a lot to lose. So these men, they have a lot at stake. They're not, they're not eager to do something silly with this boat, with this ship, I should say. It's a big ship. And, uh, and they're not looking to have a, a problem. So the word lading, again, is used to represent loads. Isn't that, isn't that the case? Oftentimes we don't. Until the, you know, we got all these loads that we carry around with us. And God is going to have to strip all these loads off before we are actually ready to hear what is really important. But they're worried about all that grain. They're worried about all these souls, all these responsibilities. And oftentimes when you preach the gospel, you warn people. You're like, hey, man, listen, someday you're going to die. I mean, think about it statistically. That's 100% true. Now, the rapture could come and we'll be caught up in the air. Okay, that is, that is going to happen. But the, <clears throat> either way, you got to be prepared for eternity. Like 100% of the people of the world have to be prepared for eternity. But you talk about it and they're like, oh, 
uh, no. Why? Because their, their ship is loaded down. Their life is loaded down. And they're caring about the grain. And they're caring about this. And they're caring about that. And they're like, no, it's not that bad. Uh, we got this. We got th- We've been doing this for years, man. I've been running my life for years. It's okay. I got this. And uh, so Paul's warning uh, is not a hunch. It's what the Lord God is communicating in and to and through him. And so Paul doesn't get dramatic about it. He simply lets them know, this is, this is what I perceive. This, sirs, this is what I'm telling you. And they would, uh, of course, learn the hard way that Paul's perception was more than a feeling, right? Uh, it was the Lord speaking to him. So this is what we got to do. We got to warn folks regardless of the response. We got to warn folks regardless of the response. In verses 11 through 13, that Paul, he's not offended that these men rest in their own wisdom. Nevertheless, right? The, the, the lie is, goes on to say, nevertheless, nevertheless. So if you look down in the verse 11 of, of the text, nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than the, those which were spoken uh, by Paul. So his co-laborers and all the passengers are going to be put in jeopardy. And notice, he, Paul didn't like get angry and go on social media. He could have, you know. He could have got out his Facebook account, Twitter, Instagram, said to everybody, man, Julius is a joke. He doesn't listen to me, man. He should listen to me. I've been through three shipwrecks. I know, I, I know the Lord God. I know what's coming, man. Julius isn't paying attention. No, he doesn't have that kind of attitude at all. He's very submissive because he's a prisoner after all. And, uh, and uh, he doesn't get online and, and diss on the owner and the captain of, you know, Egypt International Cargo. No, he doesn't boycott anybody. He just says, okay, guys, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you because I care, but, hey, you know, that's fine. Um, and nevertheless, you know, Julius did what he wanted to do. Now, Julius, by the way, has every human reason to, to listen to the owner of the ship and the master. I was analyzing this going, you know, it doesn't make any logical sense for Julius to listen to Paul. Number one, he's not a sailor. He has no stake on this thing. He's just going to Rome. Uh, why would he care what Paul thinks? You know, he's, he's, it's, that's why Paul's so respectful because he probably, he's piping up, but he knows that really, this isn't my bailiwick. This is not what I do for a living. Julius has every reason to listen to the people who are responsible for this vessel and the cargo on it and and, of course, his authority as the Roman um, centurion there. So these men were professionals. They understood sailing. They knew what they were doing. They had every reason to be careful with the ship and the cargo. They didn't want to lose either. And they didn't want to put their passengers in danger. So Julius's wisdom, it, it really can't be faulted because Fair Havens was not the best place to anchor for winter. Uh, they wanted to go to Phoenix, which is only about 40 or 50 miles down the coast. And at the moment, the weather agreed. So he has three to four witnesses saying, uh, if you're Julius, you got a couple men, you have the circumstances, the weather's good, everything. And his own gut instinct is like, yeah, let's do this. No one's going to say no. The, the, the coming of this Jew, you know, recently turned Christian evangelist, it just wasn't logical to Julius. It's like, Paul, yeah, we got it, buddy. Thanks. But you know, I, I got to tell you, it, it was sound judgment at length, wasn't it? And there's a lesson here for us because we got to learn some lessons on consensus. Oftentimes, consensus will lead you into storms and not out of them. I'll say that twice. Oftentimes, consensus will lead you into storms and not out of storms. In Proverbs 16, 25, the Bible says, There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I mean, there's times you think you're just doing the right thing, but, you know, the bridge is out. So consensus was a real problem in Numbers 13. When 10 of the 12 spies decided to, to, it was too dangerous to claim the promised land, it cost Israel 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. The consensus of 10 was really not the right direction to go at all. The consensus of the, the young men in 1 Kings 12 to Rehoboam, it was a bad consensus, right? Put the burden on them more. It caused the kingdom of Israel, uh, the nation of Israel to divide in half, right? And, and they would not ever come back together after that, 
I mean, that was a major problem. That was a major mistake by Rehoboam, listening to the, the crowd of his contemporaries. The consensus of the children of Israel who made the golden calf, man. If you were down there, and Moses and, Moses and uh, Joshua, they're up on the mount. They're up on Mount Sinai. But everybody took a vote. Hey, let's have a party down here. It sounds like a good idea to make a golden calf. I mean, come on. And everybody's getting into it. Disco lights are going. It's awesome, man. They're just, it felt great. But it wasn't the right thing to do. Even Aaron got caught up in all that. It's a reproach to his name to this day. It's recorded forever. The consensus of the Pharisees put Jesus, right? The Pharisees, Sadducees, put Jesus on the cross, killed him. Take a vote. Is Jesus the Messiah? Nope. Kill him. That was the consensus of the religious leaders of Jesus' day. The consensus of the Jews was to put Paul to death, which is what put Paul on this ship. The consensus of the wise men of Israel was still to stop Jesus. You know, in Jeremiah 6.10, the Bible says, to, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Jeremiah, the prophet, the weeping prophet, right? He, he knows that things are not good ahead. He's like, he's like God is saying, Who, who's going to listen Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. When they hear God's word, it's not just that they don't want to hear it. It's, it's like, man, that Bible is an old book. That Bible is a dumb book. That whole thing is a joke, man. Get me away from that. I can't hear that anymore. Man, so many times, man, some of us remember when we were like that. Man, if God's given you grace to hear the word, you need to take it. These people, a proud people, all, all, all religious, right? They have Abraham as their father. They have the covenant of circumcision. They all see themselves as God's people. And yet when God speaks, he says, listen, your problem isn't your circumcision under Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the fact that your ears do not belong to me. And ergo, your heart does not belong to me. And of course, judgment came upon the nation of Israel. Sometimes all we can do is warn those in peril. But we can't make them hearken. Man, there's some folks, I mean folks, right here in this, this church. I talked to some this morning, man. Their hearts are broken. And their lives are, their lives are in a storm because they're warning people they love and they're saying, stop, don't go there. But the people's ears are uncircumcised and they just do what, well, what they want to do. It's hard sometimes to warn people that are in peril, especially when they won't hear. But we are the hope in the storms of life. Warn those in peril. If you're a Christian, man, you have the hope of the gospel, but you've got to wait. Wait for God to work. In Acts 27 through 14, that's what we see Paul do. He waits. And as they sailed away from Fair Havens, the weather was perfect for the short trip along the coast uh, <clears throat> to Phoenix. And it seemed as though Paul's concern for the welfare of the ship and the souls on it was unjustified. God could have defended his apostle. You know, he could have said, when Paul stepped up and said, I perceive that there's going to be a great storm and peril to the cargo and the ship and our lives. And then God could have just went, you know, and a big old storm could have come up and they would, and they just said, oh, you must be right. But God didn't. God just said, go sit down, Paul. They're going to learn this one the hard way. He wanted Paul's word to have greater impact. He allowed the calm before the storm. He allowed those words to fall on deaf ears so that they would think harder and harder upon that message as the days grew longer and longer. There are people that hear the word of God. They don't think much of it, but as the days go on, they think more and more of it. I know I was there. Just little things my grandpa would tell me. World's going to end by fire, son, grandson. And I'm like, huh? Now let's watch Johnny Carson, right? And uh, I'd sit there and think about that and think about that. And years later, when I read Revelation, I was like, oh, that's what he was talking about. When the storms of life came, I became ready to listen. Greater impact by bringing the, there's greater impact often by bringing the news in the calm of the storm. Because when the real storms come, they start to realize, man, that person was right on target. But you know what's cool? What's really awesome is God put the messenger in the storm with them. That's, beloved, that's why we're on the earth right now. No matter what comes, God's put us here because 
we're the hope in the storm and we go with the folks on the storm and we just we we encourage them as they go through the tough times paul's going to make it to rome but he's not sure they are <laughs> right he's like hey guys i'm not sure if you're going to make it there are times we get frustrated when things don't go our way or work out in our timing but we can learn from the Apostle Paul here. Sometimes our declaration of truth seems to fall on deaf ears and hard, rocky soil. But just wait. The Scripture promises the Word of God does not return void in Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. If you'd have seen Paul declare that and go sit down, you'd have, got, you'd have thought, that's the great Apostle Paul. That didn't go anywhere. But you know what? It wasn't the great Apostle Paul. It was God speaking through the Apostle Paul. And God's word did not return void. In Acts 27 and verse 13, it says, And when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euryclidon. And the ship was caught and could not bear up in the wind. And we let her drive. You know, Paul, he waited without whining. He didn't get on social media and start sharing his frustrations. He, had, he, he respectfully went back to his place as a prisoner of Julius and, and placed the matter in God's hands. And he exemplified the maturity of a shepherd. In 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 6, the Bible says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You know, Paul understood that this was under God's mighty hand. All of this was in God's hand, and he cared. So Paul cast his care upon the Lord. Paul knew he was going to get to Rome. But I'm sure that he went down, and he grabbed Mark, and he grabbed Aristarchus, and he said, hey, guys, let's say it the Lord. You know, this is what the Lord shared with me. Let's pray. I know that because later on, God actually confirms when he does come. He says, hey, Paul... You get everybody on the ship. They were praying. I believe they were praying. I think it bothered Paul that these people could perish. Who are we praying for today? It's Memorial Day. We remember those who have perished, but hey, do we look ahead at all those who are about to perish? And do we go to prayer? It's hard, isn't it? I know it's hard to pray because I, I, I have to exercise myself in that. I get to exercise myself in that. That's my calling. But man, we all need to be about praying. I think the church goes forward. I think that's partially the reason probably a lot of times our church buildings under normal circumstances uh, are not full because it's not about evangelistic efforts or all the energy we'll put into doing something. It's about all the energy we need to recognize who's perishing and praying. I got a person or two in particular I'm praying for like this week that they, they know they need to get saved. And I'm praying, oh God, lead them, bring them to yourself. And are you witnessing to people? Are you sharing the gospel? Are you, are you warning them and waiting for God to do his work? That's what we need to be about. We don't have to worry about things going our way if we're assured they are going God's way. Paul didn't have to worry about whether they received his message or not. As long as they were going God's way, everything was good. We need that next slide, please, because I'm about to pass by it. And so, so we don't have to worry about things going our way if we're assured that they're going God's way. So Paul and his shipmates didn't have to wait long before experiencing the force of Euryclidon. In uh, chapter 27, verses 14 and 15, we see there that the text says this temp tempestuous wind called Euryclidon blew upon them and, and made sailing down the coast impossible. Many confuse this with like the Western Hemisphere's nor'easter, right? But it is not that. It's a completely different type of cyclone and wind and it's clear from the text that, the, that this initially was blowing south and east, but before the storm is over, they're going up and down in the Mediterranean. They find themselves, you know, preparing to hit the sands of the North African coast. And then the next thing you know, you see them going up and down, the text says, and then they're in the Aegean Sea. So, and they are just, they are bouncing across the Mediterranean, and uh, they are going this way and that. They're blown all over the place and end up on the south of Italy before they hit modern-day Malta. So you can read volumes about Euryclidon or Euryclidon from the scholars, but little common, sense and, little common sense and belief in God's Word makes it clear how this ship was probably near, I think, probably the eye of a storm system. That's where the calm came from. Next thing you know, they just got, whew, they got whipped into it. We often have storms that, that cycle around here in multiple directions, and we can experience those same type of symptoms. But, you know, there's a reason that Archie's mascot is the whirlwinds, right? Because we understand 
that when big storms come, man, the winds blow every direction. So this strong wind <clears throat> is a very real metaphor uh, for the storms uh, that, of, that, that come when people teach false doctrine. And, and I tell you what, the church, I can't stress this enough, the church is the agent whereby God has intended to calm the storm. So in Ephesians 4, the Bible says in verse 11, speaking of the church and how he gifts the church, he says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The strength, the building of the body of Christ is very important to the, to the winds and the storms of this world. It says, until, until we all come into the unity of the faith. Jesus said, I'll be with you always, even till the end of the world. You know, Jesus is riding out the storm with his saints. He's in us of a truth. He's teaching us. He's equipped us. He's prepared us as a body that we henceforth, 14, be no more children. Oh, well, let me back up. Under the perfect man, under the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more, verse 14, children. And here it comes. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the slight of men and the cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. You know, we joke about people being full of wind, right? Wind bags and all of that. But the fact of the matter is the words that we speak, God's word is true. It's fact. It's, and the words of God are more than they're preserved for us. They're inspired. God inspires them. He empowers them. But there's also forces. There are people who speak things. And, and out of their lips come doctrines that become like wind tunnels, man. They become cycles of wind that cycle around the church. They've been cycling around for 2,000 years from the first century till now. And it is the church of the living God that is the pillar and the ground of truth. This is the place. And churches that believe the word of God and teach the word of God are the place of the grounding of the body of Christ. That We run into Christ who is our rock. We are not moving and we, we are the salt and the light. It's so important. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ and our presence on this planet until Jesus Christ calls us up. I cannot stress it enough. That's why we are not moved in the storms of life. The word of God, the spirit of God, the local New Testament church is called the pillar and ground of truth because it stabilizes a world that would otherwise be completely carried away with false teaching. The, the spirit of Antichrist moved already in the first century. So what John said, the spirit of Antichrist does already work, right? We know that. But the reality is that it, why hasn't he done everything he can do? Because the church has been here. The pillar and ground of the truth, stabilizing the souls that come to Christ, being salt and light in a world that would otherwise perish. All of us in this generation before Christ comes can clearly see what happens when men change the standing fast to compromise and consensus. Before long, clarity becomes cloudy. Truth becomes a lie. Confusion begins to rule. And we'll shut down the whole world's economy to, to save elderly and, 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 and afflicted people, which we should. That's, that's a good sign. That shows that we have a conscience. But in the midst of that, we are blind to the fact that we'll take a, and encourage people to kill infants in the womb. What? How contradictory is that? What is that? That's confusion, friends. It's a world that's confused. It's a world that's blown about. There's no body in that womb that can cry out and advocate. And we're here to advocate for him. Now, I'm not going to get, I don't want to get off on that too far. And we're all about moms that have gone through abortions, or, or women, I should say, gone through abortions. And we have, and I can talk, we got people here in our church that can talk to you personally. So we're all about grace. So I'm not condemning people that have had abortions, but I am condemning the fact that, that we condone it. It's a lot easier to prevent an abortion by not having one, you know. And so uh, there's a lot of other things you can do to prevent it. I won't get into that. I just said that. I need to take my own word. Okay, so if you express compassion, if you express compassion for those suffering from gender dysphoria, you're like, oh my, I'm sorry that you had to mutilate yourself. I'm sorry you're confused about your gender to the point of self-mutilation. That's actually a, that's a word. It's a scientific word called gender dysphoria. But if you have that mindset that you're, instead of, having, instead of saying it's okay, but you say, no, it's not okay, 
You're actually mutilating yourself, and this might really harm you emotionally for the rest of your life. Now you're the bad guy. Why is that? Well, brethren, because we need to make sure we, we, we have somewhere have left off the warnings of this word. We really don't believe it anymore. Now, if you don't know Christ, that's what you're going to think. I used to think all kinds of stuff before I met Christ that was totally contradictory to truth. But once you're saved, man, God needs to change our minds. He needs to change our hearts. If you think God doesn't know what's going on in the culture, you think God's asleep, you're kidding yourself. In Isaiah, God said this, Woe unto them, in verse 20 of chapter 5, He says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink who justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteous, righteousness of the righteous from him. Woe unto them. Sometimes God allows the storm so those who are not listening will open their ears and hear what he has to say. So Paul waits. Paul waits while the ship is caught in this terrible storm system. In Acts 27, 15, it says, And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. Meaning, they couldn't do anything but let the storm take this ship and let her drive. They take the sails down and let it go. They drifted about 23 miles to the south of, uh, of the Isle of Crete to this isle called Clouda. And, and they come under this island called Clouda, and, and the water is calm enough, it's not calm, I'm sure, but it was calm enough for them to, to fortify the ship for the rough waters that they had been in and, and to prepare for the w- w- uh, rough waters ahead. So the phrase, we had much work to come by the boat, is referring to the, the small boats, those crafts that were on the side of the ships. You've probably seen those in, in images. And I think they were probably tangled up, probably full of water, you know, taking on water. So they're trying to, you know, work to get these ships, these little boat, these vessels ready so that they could wrap rope or chains around the hull of this boat so that it would be held together in the rough sailing that was coming ahead. And so this was a lot of of work and anxiety. You know, they're trying to utilize the the window that they had just by this little island on the south of Crete as the the storm is going to blow them off into the Mediterranean. And so Paul waits patiently while the ship is undergirded and emptied. The experience of the crew is seen as they, they're miles away from the north coast of Africa, uh, but they're concerned about the ship getting stuck in a sandbar. So they're actually preparing to sail to the north side of Africa. And that's what they're worried about initially with the sand and, 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 and fortifying the hull. Uh, and, and notice that it says there, here that, that Luke says, we, we in verse 18 in the text, he says, and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest the next day, they lighted the ship. They lighted the. Sh- they they lightened the ship. Initially, the, the you know they're taking care of it. Whoever they are, the, the 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 people that are the crew on the ship. But you notice in verse nineteen, then he says, and and we, or verse nineteen, in the third day we cast out with our own hands, just in case we're missing it, the tackling of the ship. I mean, all hands on deck, everybody, let's all go. And they're heave hoeing, man. They probably had heavy items on there, and they're tossing them off. They're lightening the ship so it can bear up in the storm. And even Luke, Dr. Luke, is getting his hands in on the action. Then on the third day, we, Luke, Paul, Aristarchus, and anyone who was commanded threw all that tackle off. And now they're down to just grain. And eventually they'll have to throw that off as well. But they want to keep that grain through the storm. At this, at this point, finding a harbor to resupply is the last thing on their minds. Now they're finally to the point where they just want to survive the storm. Maybe this morning you're listening, maybe you're online and you're listening, and your life is a storm, and you just, man, it's cost you everything, and, and you just want to hang on to what you got. I, I just want to keep the bread. I just want to keep my refrigerator stocked. I want to keep my meat in the freezer so I have something to eat. I want to have... I want, to, I want to keep my house. I don't, I don't want to lose my house. I don't want to lose my car, whatever it is. And, and the storms of life make you just shred down and shred down and shred down. And man, you're just wanting to survive at this point. Paul waited until all hope was lost. In verse 20, look what it says. And it says, and when neither sun nor stars 
In many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Now remember, this is Luke writing, and he's not talking in the third person now. He's saying, we. I thought, I think we, I think, I think Paul's going to Rome, but I don't think I am. I think it's over, man. I don't know how God's going to get Paul there, but it looks like we're all going down. Now, all hope was lost. Maybe you're listening this morning, and in your life, all hope seems lost, but I got good news for you. We have hope in the storms of life. You know, remember, none of them know at this point how it's going to end. Not even Luke, who's writing. Paul doesn't know how it's even going to end until the Lord speaks to him. He knows how it's going to end for him. It appeared that even, even, even Luke was thinking that, man, this is probably going to end bad. But Paul warned those in peril. Paul waited for God to work, and then, man, Paul heard that voice. And just like every great movie you've ever seen, the hero shows up just in time. And man, in verse 21, it says, But after a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, he's very respectful, (laughs) but he also gently rebukes them. You should have hearkened unto me and not loose from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. If you'd have listened to me, you wouldn't have had any harm or any loss. But then he goes on to say in verse 22, And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. But now, they're, you know what the difference is? They don't care anymore about the grain. They don't care about the ship. They just want to live. You know, sometimes God has to put us in a place when storms of life come so we can focus on the things that are really important. Man, God bless you if he's blessed you with stuff. But at the end of the day, God doesn't care about your stuff. He cares about your soul. He loves you. And sometimes the storms of life come so that we will be one, right? We need to be one by the words that have weight from people who are filled with the Spirit of God, that come from the Word of God, so that our lives can be put on course and they can be spared. And so maybe that's as far as I'm going to get. That's 2.9 this morning. We'll finish up the rest of this next time. But I want you to, this morning, just to pause there and understand that Paul, he had to bring the bad news before he could share the good news. And sometimes the storms of life, are they're not there because God wants you to go through storms. They're there because you have to go through storms before you're ready to listen. But man, if you're going through the storms of life, today, like no other day, is a great day to listen to the good news that Jesus Christ is alive. It's not just a fable. It's not just something that people talk about. It's not just some history lesson from 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was buried and he's alive right now. And he wants to know you in a very personal way. He wants to literally meet you in your storm. He wants, to, he wants you to hear the good news that not only did he die on the cross for our sins, not only was he buried, but he is alive right now. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, just like it says here, they shall be saved. Every one of these people was saved. You know, God sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross 2,000 years ago. The Bible says, because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants everyone to change their mind about their own wisdom, to change their heart about thinking, I got this. I'm experienced in life. I've gone through a lot of storms. And get to the place where we say, you know what? Your word is what matters, Lord. I'm going to believe you when you say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to believe you when the Bible tells us that there's no way to get to the Father but through the Son. I'm going to believe you when the Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Maybe today, right now, you're watching online or maybe you're in the room. You're like, uh, we had someone this morning raise their hand and they received Jesus as their Savior. What that means is they heard the message, they heard the call, and in the midst of their storms, they came to the place where they were willing to hear what God had to say and trust Him and Him alone for salvation. And so if you're here this morning and maybe you're in the room or maybe you're not in the room, maybe you're watching online and you're at that place, today is the day of salvation. God wants to save you. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I, I pray for anyone under the sound of my voice that is in a situation in life that maybe for the first time they're hearing the good news that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the, the way to escape the storms of life. He is the, the man that has allowed us to, to be our foundation, the one in which we run into when the storms come the one that has secured eternal life for us. I pray, Heavenly Father, for anyone in the sound of my voice that is not saved or doesn't have the assurance of eternal life. 
Lord, that doesn't have assurance that you will get them to the other shore, that today would be the day that they put that faith in you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, please. Uh, in, the, in, in the house first, if you're in the building this morning and you're like, Brian, I need to be saved, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand right where you are. We had a young lady in the first service. We had a couple people raise their hands. Anybody at all? For salvation, I need to be saved. All right. Maybe you're online watching. If you need to be saved, you're online. Call our church, church building, 816-380-3033. We will answer the phone right now, and we will talk to you. You can email us at contact at hbf, uh, hbfcast.org, and we will talk to you. You could even hit someone up on the chat box in uh, Facebook or YouTube, whichever you're on. Are we on both of those? And uh, they'll respond to you, and we'll get you connected and directed. And if you're a member here this morning or online, man, I pray that we finish strong. Is there any Christians say, Brian, man, I am on, I'm, I'm on the ship, but I'm in the storm. Just pray for me this morning. I need some prayer. Anyone at all. Amen. Let's pray for one another. Heavenly Father, we pray for the saints in Christ. Thank you for not only giving us hope in the storm, but making us the hope in the storm. Lord, Paul was the hope that they had. Uh, Lord, you use us as your ambassadors. Lord, Paul was an ambassador for Christ. May we be good ambassadors uh, this day, this weekend, this Memorial weekend. May we remember those that have died to make us free so that we, like Paul, can share the gospel as we ought. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. It is true. Lord, may we be about, uh, Lord, uh, uh, warning people and, and waiting for you to work. And then at the right time, Lord, may we win them to Christ for your honor, for your glory, for your kingdom's sake. We thank you and we praise you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I didn't ask you to stand up, so you don't have to be seated. You're already seated. So let's do this. Let's stand up. And uh, if you're online with us still, we are glad that you joined us this morning. And I'm just going to have a few announcements, and I'm going to ask Jim to come and dismiss us with a word of prayer. But just remember, next Sunday, 1030, uh, we're going to be meeting right here uh, for the Lord's Supper. And uh, if there is not enough room, which really it should be, it's going to be close if everybody that's been coming comes, both services together. Uh, we'll have some overflow options. I know nobody wants to do overflow, so we'll just draw straws. We'll arm wrestle at a safe distance or something. We'll figure it out. But, uh, but I think everybody, for the most part, is going to be able to fit in here. Um, and so uh, second service has grown a little bit, praise the Lord, from the first week. Uh, and then the following week after that, we will have uh, the, the service at the park, Lord willing, weather permitting, and at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, as we do every year. Of course, there'll be some safe distance precautions and all of that that uh, we'll notify you of as we get closer. Adult Bible fellowships are on, both uh, as directed by your ABF pastor, both today and next week, uh, as we've been doing them in the month of May. Uh, consult your ABF pastor for the time. Most of them are doing in the evening, but not all. Uh, and some are suspending for like this weekend, which is fine. It's up to them. So consult them. If you're looking to get in on an ABF, uh, if yours is, is not going, there are going to be some probably going uh, throughout the whole month of May. And, uh, and then, of course, on, on the 7th of June, we'll all just be meeting together at one time. So that'll be a great time. All right. So uh, having said that, Jim, if you could close us in a word of prayer. Thank you for coming this morning. Thank you for your gifts as well and, uh, and for giving back to the Lord. Let's pray. Yes, sir. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Thank you for the young lady this morning that accepted you as the Lord and Savior. And for the young man, Lord, that, that came forward to, to just reconfirm his life. Lord, we just pray for them that you would uh, be with them, guide them. And uh, Lord, be with each one of us as we travel and keep us safe. Uh, protect us, Lord, uh, as we go and visit with our families this weekend. And Lord, we just thank you for those men and women that have served this country to keep us safe, so that we can have the freedom to be here today. And we just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.